now from the playing field of Banneker to the locker room of RFK Stadium. It's Inside Sports with your host, Harold Bell. Well, Harold has been a, a crusader for the rights of black people all of his life. He has also been a crusader that have had a lot of friends, not only in the black community, but the white community in sports. And uh, he's one of my friends over the years. We've done many things together. So Harold is truly a man that believes in his culture and his people and will always be that way because nobody's ever been able to change him. So, hey, that's my partner. In the sports world today, everyone claims to be an insider. Harold Bell is the original insider. Washington Times sports columnist Dick Heller says, Harold Bell is the godfather of sports talk, the good kind. He played message music such as Wake Up Everybody by Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, What's Going On by his homeboy and friend Marvin Gaye, and the James Brown classic Black and Proud. He was the first on-air sports talk show personality to write commentaries and the first to host sports media roundtables. Harold Bell is the man for all seasons. He was the first sports media personality to involve pro athletes, politicians, judges, entertainers, and media personalities in his community endeavors. In November 1974, he became the first Afro-American to host and produce his own sports television special in prime time on NBC affiliate WRC-TV4 in Washington, D.C. His special guest, the greatest, Muhammad Ali. You know, they say that our friendship is, is like our shadows. They're sticking with you as long as you're in the sun, but once you cross over into the shade, the shadow disappears. How do you distinguish your friends? Well, I wrote something once that says, Friendship is a priceless gift that cannot be bought in our soul, but its value is far greater than a mountain made of gold. For gold is cold and lifeless, it can neither see nor hear. In time of trouble, it's powerless to cheer. It has no ears to listen, no heart to understand. It cannot bring you comfort or reach out a helping hand. So when you ask God for gifts, be thankful if he sins. Not diamonds, pearls, or riches, but the love of real true friends. Hey, all right all right all right welcome to speak the truth today is july 31st 2022 and you just heard the intro of our host mr harold bell i'm gary johnson the publisher and founder of blackmenandamerica.com, and over to you, Mr. Bell. Yeah. Well, one of those things you just heard, you never heard Muhammad Ali promote nobody, <laughs> nobody ever in his whole career. And uh, I'm always amazed that I can look back and say Muhammad Ali promoted inside sports. <laughs> and that's a hell of a thing, man. That's, 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 what, that's what friendship is all about. And uh, today... Um, we're going to do this thing, uh, take me <laughs> take me out to the game. Gary, hit that for me, and I can come back and introduce our, our special guest. Valley Cali, the baseball game, knew the players, knew all their names. You could see how their everyday shot hooray when they played. Her boyfriend by the name of Joe said to Coney I'll dear we'll go. Then Nellie started to fret and pout. And to him I heard her shout, Hey, take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jack. I don't care if I never get back. Let me root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Cause it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Hey, that's enough of that. All right. My friend, 
who's so involved with um, with young people, and uh, he's not only uh, the CEO, the manager, the coach, the jack of all the trades for the RBI team of the Atlanta Braves, but he also is a former president of a hundred black men of Decade County. He's an account executive. Uh, they have done, I mean, great things on him about his role in the community, but uh, also he faces a whole lot of obstacles despite, uh, you know, his background. He's a former uh, baseball player himself, his son, sons of uh, played in the minor leagues. So I'm bring, this all brings me back to what I had to do on Monday night. I had 50 tickets to take uh, uh, kids to a game, uh, the Baltimore Orioles in Baltimore. And I haven't done this in years, man. <laughs> you know, I got I got 50 tickets. I can't turn them down. So I go to Baltimore, take these kids or uh, those kids who came and joined in or whatever, but end up having about 30 people go to the game. And uh, it was an amazing experience, even for me, again, to, to sit out in that stadium, even though it was half full, to see I'd be on a beautiful night like that and have these kids at the game and join the game. But I found out, I, I learned a terrible lesson that I couldn't buy the kids no drinks or nothing because they don't they don't take cash no more. You know, they would, I went up to the, get some pizza and the lady said, uh, uh, we don't take cash. You have to go down to the ATM and put money on a, on a debit card or credit card and buy, uh, you know, buy food for kids. So that, that was a downer, but the kids had a great time. And uh, I just want to thank John for all that he's done, man. You know, as far as our <laughs> friendship goes, it goes back some years. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, the one and only uh, John. Come on in, big John. Well, uh, first of all, as always, it's an honor to be on the show with um, Harold and the rest of you guys. Uh, as Harold knows, throughout the summer, while you haven't seen me, um, I run a sports program called ATL Metro RBI, and it stands for Atlanta Metropolitan Area Reviving Baseball in the Inner City. And we target um, we target a much. Can you guys hear me? I got an echo. Uh, we target uh, we a much. Hear. Yeah, okay. We target a much older group only because I don't have the financial resources to do as I like to, but I'm trying to move into that direction. We started 14, unless you're exceptional at 13, we started 14 and go up to 18, transition the kids into college. This year we had seven kids sign scholarships. Uh, we average anywhere from four to 10 a year uh, going on to college. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. And, and uh, by the grace of God, we put over 157 kids in college. Uh, 18, now 19 with my son signing with the Padres. He recently was injured and was released, but 19 in the pros and five in the big leagues. Um, and these are kids that we've touched. But I was at a funeral on another subject, and I'll get back to this. It's about baseball. I was at a funeral and spoke this week, and the pastor – because this guy who, who passed away, Milton Reed, he coached T-ball for over 45 years. T-ball. And, and if you know anything about coaching, a four- and five-year-old attention span is really short. But he brought the biblical sense in and why he wanted to coach T-ball. Because... A man once said, a great man once said, it's easier to build a strong child than to rebuild a broken man. And so he stayed with the little kids. And of that group, he's had everybody that's gone through Gresham Park, that's played in the NFL, NBA, as well, Major League Baseball. They all, when others would have 12 on his team, he'd have 19. And he would tell the parents, Many single mothers, he said, now we do spank them. So if you won't, don't want me to spank your child, then you don't want them on my team. And he had this little glove, flimsy glove, he ran around the field with, would pat him on the behind if they was out of line or running crazy. And I would say to myself, no way I could ever coach T-ball. <laughs> but hearing his story was amazing. And the pastor said, 
you know, when my son got four years old, I got a phone call from Milton Reed. Where's my shortstop? Where's my shortstop? And he was like, what are you talking about, man? He said, he said, isn't your son four years old now? He said, yeah, then he should be out here with me. Why is he not out here? Well, his mama wanted him to wait. I don't want to hear that. I need him out here. He got to start learning sometime. He can learn now. He said, and we get out there, and that's my first child, and my wife and I are sitting out in the stands, and he's playing shortstop, and some big kid hits it off the tee hard. It takes one hop and hits him in the chest, and it stops right there in front of him, and it makes a loud thump. So he says, I, I don't know if he heard or not, but before I could get out of the stands and, and my wife get out of the stands, Reed was right there holding him. And he looked at him and he said, great stop, young man. Great stop. And that, that made the boy smile. And he held his hand up like that to his parents, like I did something good. And he said, and I realized that had I go out there, I would have said, are you okay? Are you hurt? When Milton immediately gave him a positive reinforcement of doing something good, which made that boy go on to play college baseball later in life at Morehouse mm -hmm. and get his degree. But he would have quit right then if I would have gone out there and said, are you OK? Are you hurt? He said, I learned something from Coach Reed. He built those little kids up. So when Harold asked me about speaking on this subject, that weighed heavy on my mind. Take me out to the ball game because baseball is a sport. And most of the guys on this call can relate to what I'm saying was passed down from father to son or uncle or grandfather to son, but not something that you went out on the playground and learned. You didn't play pickup like basketball. Football is a game of athleticism and heart enhanced by skill. Basketball is a game of athleticism enhanced by skill. But baseball is a skilled game enhanced by athleticism. So if the skill is not being developed, playing catch with your older brother or your father or your grandfather or your uncle, hitting a stick ball or top or with a stick or what have you, and you're not learning, then you can't show up with my kids at 15. And I get some moms that say, you know, my son really likes baseball and wants to play. And I had a kid come in about six feet, 145, 155 pounds at 14, and he could not walk and chew gum. And he loved the game, but it was too dangerous for me to be able to have him out there with the other kids. So take me out to the ball game was significant because everybody went to the ball game. Even in prejudice times, the blacks still sat in, in the prejudice section, but they got to watch the game. A part of learning is watching. Kids don't watch baseball anymore. Uh, they play video games, and they play video games of the things that they're relating to and they like. And so baseball is not something, and it's dying in our community. Atlanta is at an all-time high. And I wish I could take the credit for it, but it's not just me. I have GBSA, uh, Marquise Grissom, uh, Marvin Freeman, uh, myself, uh, I can go on and on. We have about 10 to 15 black programs, which they have different agendas. That's anybody's business, but they're at least playing baseball. And, and because of that, you guys notice in the first round, four of the first round, first 10 picks were of African-American descent, and they all touched Atlanta in some way. From Rocker, who played at Vanderbilt, to Tamar Johnson that went to Mays, Southwest Atlanta's high school, uh, to Andrew Jones, who father lived here, and he played in the different leagues around here, to uh, Cam Collier from Chicago, but grew up, his son grew up here in Atlanta. He did something amazing. At 16, he won the state championship, and he said, you know what, I'm going to let my son get his GED. He's going to go to junior college. So Cam is supposed to be a high school senior this year, he played junior college, hit 327 or something with about 12 home runs and 18 pick, $5 million later. But out of the whole first round, 
uh, I think it was about eight African Americans, the largest pool ever in the history of Major League Baseball. But that doesn't mean that blacks are playing baseball. That just means that those that are playing and have played at a high level have excelled because as one white boy told me, and then I'll stop here and let you uh, finish. As one white guy told me, he said, John, he's a, col he's a college coach of FAMU. Uh, he's white. And he said, you know, uh, it's hard for me to go to some of these perfect games and these big tournaments because he said, these kids are only looking to go to power five and their country clubs. Baseball has become a country club for rich white boys because they get all the training, all the uh, uh, facilities, all the resources. And so they get signed to these big colleges. But the one thing they haven't done is competed. They don't compete because when you got everybody on your team throwing 90 and everybody's good as far as putting the ball in play and y'all beating everybody 10 to nothing, 15 to nothing, and the umpires are cheating for you because your parents pay the program a lot of money. It's why Florida State has gone to the, uh, the NCAA finals 65 times and never won anything because mm -hmm. I played against them and they flat cheat down there. You got to throw the ball on the plate. <laughs> I mean, so black kids playing baseball right now. I went to the cab County. I went to the CEO, told him we need a turf field. He said, John, that's very expensive. I said, they'll pay for themselves. I said, everywhere I go on the North side, these white schools got turf field. I said, we ought to be able to have at least one in one of the parks and recreation. He said, well, tell me the significance because he never played ball much. I said, when it rains, it ruins the day for us. And we don't have the groundskeepers, the booster clubs, or the parents to work on it. But in a turf field, when it rains, you wait 20 minutes, it sit, dries, and then you go play. Mm -hmm. And you can play all day. And so Gresham Park got a $1.5 million splash award, and the Braves kicked in $1.5 million. And Gresham Park has the state-of-the-art field. Now, here's my argument about that. Now Morehouse comes over there and uses it. And it's supposed to be for the kids. And Morehouse uh, I'll cut a deal. And that perfect game, the white program that's up north, they ain't got enough field, so they pay them $1,000 a day to use their field. Mm. So I called perfect game and said, at least you can have all my games played at Gresham. Since I was instrumental in getting the field, I don't want to drive 60 miles. I have to pick up kids. I don't have soccer moms. I don't have people that off work in, on a Tuesday, on a Wednesday for a 10 o'clock game. Hell, guys, I'm not even supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be at work. But with me working from home, <laughs> I get up at 6 a.m. and work as much as I can. And then I drive and pick a couple of kids up, go to the field, play the game, then come back home and have them Uber back home. Whatever I can do. The best thing they did was they started to work with me, and they let me play at Gresham. They let me play at the fields that are within 30 minutes of my home. Because most of the best fields are hour to hour and a half away from kids. Black kids do not, Gresham Park now has a bigger enrollment than they've had in 20 years because they put in those turf fields and they brought excitement to the park. So take me out to the ball game is live and well at Gresham Park, but it's not in the black community. Right. Well, you know, I want everybody here to, to understand uh, why this show was so important today because, you know, <laughs> there's a fraud going on you know, they, they celebrate Jackie Robinson every year and they put 42 on everybody. And that gives you the impression that there are a whole lot of black African Americans playing in Major League Baseball. And that's not true. We got we got 7% or 6%, John, baby, tell you. I think it's 7. I think it's 7. 7% now, 7% of Major League Baseball, they're African Americans, man. What in the 70s, they? it was 24%. Wow. Now they're down to seven. What did Jackie Robinson, man, go through all that for and die for at an early age, man? And we still and we still got people uh, uh, perpetrating a fraud on us and thinking that, you know, we got black athletes out there on in Baltimore on last Monday night. John had one of his boys playing center field, uh, Cedric Mullins. Is Cedric uh, African-American, John? Yes. He is. One African American on Baltimore Orioles team. The Braves got one. The Braves got one. 
Michael Harris. Wow, that's that is unbelievable. <clears throat> so I just want to <clears throat> say that guys like John, as hard as he worked, man, <clears throat> I take my hat off to him. And that's why I, I had to go over to Baltimore Monday night, <clears throat> even though it was gonna be a <clears throat> excuse me, a hardship for me. But our kids got to be exposed to that type of environment so they can see what they're really missing, man. And they, they really enjoyed it. So I want to invite all of you to come in and just, just talk and ask John questions about what does the future look like? Because not only are Black athletes being devalued, weighted, I mean, devalued in Major League Baseball, but also in, in the National Football League. They, they, they downplaying the, the accomplishments of the Black quarterback. When one time we didn't have any black quarterback, now we got black quarterbacks flourishing and they seem not to like it. There's an old saying, they like our rhythm, but they don't like our blues. Some of, some, somebody else come on in. I see we got Rick Jones, we got Dante Taylor out there, we got Lawrence Lucas out there, and of course we got Gary. Come on in, anybody. <clears throat> well, one thing I would like to say is, uh... Uh, John, uh, I'm just amazed uh, that you've done so much with so little. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of people have resources coming at them that, that, that accomplish some of the same kind of things that you have. Uh, you've done it with your own resources. Uh, I'm just uh, sitting here just listening and the only thing I can say is I, I, I'm just amazed that you've been able to accomplish what you have. And I'm sure that these young uh, men are really benefiting from all the work that you've done. But it seems like uh, we need more John Hollins out there to pick up the gauntlet in other cities doing some of the same kinds of things that you're doing. Uh, you know, just you just informed me about uh, the difference between playing on dirt and playing on grass. Uh, that in itself is an education for me to know that uh, there's a big difference between what white boys are playing on and what uh, black boys are playing on. And I'm talking about the right kind of fields to get the best result. So, uh, I just so, want to say so, thank you. So, so, Mr. Lucas, let me let me uh, add to that because that, that's a subject mm -hmm. matter that that's near and dear to my heart. And first of all, the best surface to play baseball on is grass and dirt. I'm a ball player; nobody would love it even more. But it requires a lot of maintenance. So, what what the white folks have done is, for tournament purposes, to make more money, they put in turf fields because that way the rain doesn't change the game. I don't have to worry about having the groundskeeper keeping it up. I dropped some pebbles on it, which is those black pebbles you put on turf. I dropped some pebbles on it after the game, and the mound I might have to fix up, but otherwise you can play 10 games a day on it. You hmm. couldn't play 10 games a day on a dirt field because you're digging the dirt up. You got to bring some more dirty in. Uh, if it rains, you got some mud spots. It changes, so you got to have a real uh, – uh, what's what's the word for a specialist and – and lawn care, you gotta, you gotta have a real person handling that. Those people that take care of those major league baseball fields, those guys go to college for that. Oh, those They're groundskeepers, just, they, yeah. Yeah, those groundskeepers, but it's it's a it's a degree in ultra culture or something, I forget the name Water of culture? it. Horticulture? Yeah, they do it, they, they get it down in Florida. And then they, they get hired by a different stadium. I mean, they can make the grass grow a certain way. You ever look at it, and sometimes it looked like the grass going that way one way and it's going that way. <laughs> yeah. These guys are awesome. I had the pleasure 15 years ago to go out to the Brave Stadium and work with the groundskeeper on how to better keep our mounds up. <clears throat> he taught me a lot of stuff and what we could do in the batter's box and everything. But then he started going into some details and some stuff that he does. And I'm like, no matter, no wonder why these fields look like they look. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these guys are awesome which would be a great area for some of our brothers to go into. One of the things Harold knows about that I didn't share with you guys, uh, 
Tyrone Brooks uh, runs a minority um, development arm of Major League Baseball. Uh, doing, he, doing his transition from being a Brave Scout to a Pirate Scout to going into Major League's front office, you know, I talked about, you know, nobody's recruiting SIAC ball players. Um, so my son had scholarships to Albany, Morehouse, and he said, Dad, man, you can't go pro going there. I said, yeah, but you can get a great education. He said, yeah, but I want to do both. He said, why can't you do both? You can do both in a lot of places, but not there. So I said, okay, well, let's do some research on the last 10 years. And we looked at the last 10 years out of 16 teams. Not one kid got a chance to play pro. Hmm. That right there in itself was a tragedy. And I talked to Tyrone and I talked to the Braves. The Braves hired Hank Aaron Jr., as a minority scout for the Southeast for black college and HBCUs. So I helped create that. Then they created a pipeline of diversity programming for kids that come from HBCUs. Five of my kids have gone into the program. Three are still currently working in major league baseball. One with the Yankees, one with the Diamondbacks and the kid with the Mets. He graduated from Morehouse with a three, seven, five, and, and, and math. So I got him a scholarship to Princeton and he chose the job with the men. I said, I said, Jason, you can go to Princeton for free. He said, yeah, but the Mets gonna hire me. So I think I want to try to go with the Mets. So he went with the Mets and did a great job with the New York Mets. And, um, they said, Hey, we want to hire you and keep you on. All these are interns. We want to keep you on. What is it that you'd like to do? And he said, besides being on the field, I'd like to be around the game. So they said, as a scout, so they, so they flew him down to Florida, Sarasota, I think it was where they were located at the time, the Mets. And the coach called up and said, man, this kid is special. We like him. So they said, we're going to send you to scouting school. So I didn't even know such a thing. They sent him to scouting school for four months, and they made him a pro scout, not an amateur scout, which I didn't know the difference in that. I'm learning so much through him. So he only scout pro teams that they're looking to make trades with down the road. So he has one organization. His organization is the Nationals. And so it's like an espionage job, guys. So he tells me, you know, we're looking at this player, that player. So they gave me an expense account. I got to go to the strip club and I'm just going to hang out like I'm one of the guys just in the club because they want to know how these guys act. And we're going to give him $100 million. What kind of brother is he really? Uh, uh, it was a Hispanic guy he was going after. He go to dinner. They don't know he's a scout. They, he's just a young black guy. He's only 26, 27 years old right now. He did such a good job. They made some moves and took some of the national players, and it helped uh, their program. Uh, he's with the uh, Mets. And now their minor league system and their team's number one, that he got promoted up to second in command of the head guy of the Mets. Now, Harold's cousin has been with the Mets for 30 years and been doing the same job the whole time because he, he – I'll let Harold speak about it. Yeah. But Jason has learned, and we being brothers on this call, understand what I'm saying. Jason has learned the internal politics without changing who you are by still maintaining your integrity and being honest and truthful about what you believe but understanding you still work for somebody. So don't be so opinionated that you tell them that their baby's ugly. You know what I'm saying? And he's doing a great job of that. They promoted him up. And so now I get to talk to him about kids. We're trying to get on that list of getting an opportunity because he's right there. But he, he's sitting by the door of the person that make the decision. So that's working out well for us. He and I had a long conversation uh, about, um, uh, some players, and I think that they may have a good chance. The guy who won the HBCU uh, MVP this year uh, of the SWAC and also the MVP of the SWAC tournament was one of my kids, and I think if he has a good year next year, they're going to draft him. But anyway, that's enough of that. But that tells you about the fields. The mm -hmm. dirt field is still the best, but the turf fields allow you to play more. It gives you less bad hops. It allows you to train better. And so you look a whole lot better on the turf field than you do on a dirt field. A dirt field, just like, I don't know if you guys saw the replay of Matt Olson when um, 
it was a big hop to him and he decided to let it hop one more time and it hit the dirt and spin off somewhere. If it was turf, it won't take that irregular bounce. You know what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. but, but dirt with seams on the ball, you don't know where it's going to bounce. So that's why you <laughs> teach kids to come get it. Come get it. Don't sit back on it because it can take, it can hit one of them divots that somebody didn't ran through and jump up and hit you in the mouth. So <laughs> on turf fields, you don't have that issue as much because it's going to take more true hops. So kids wow. look better than they really are. And then when they get in, drafted and go into minor leagues, they go, like, man, we done wasted money on another kid. He can't kick. So that's why they love those kids from the islands because they play on dirt. They play on rocks, actually. I still got some of the rocks when I went to Curacao with Ozzy Albies, and he said, I'm going to take y'all up to my field, the second baseman for the Braves. So he took us up to the field, and the kids I had were looking at the field like, how you going to play on this? He said, you come get everything or you lose all your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dante, I want to bring in Dante. Dante is the founder of uh, Cyber Hygiene and Security Solutions. Uh, Dante he jumped off. He, he gone? Oh. Yeah, we got we got Mr. Rick Jones here. Oh, Rick. How you doing, Rick? Come on, introduce yourself, Rick. This is my, my dear friend, Rick Jones, uh, who's been doing wonders with young people for over a decade. Uh, Rick, give me a little background on you, and thank you for uh, taking time out finally to be here. <laughs> Earl, I miss you. <laughs> um, a little more than a decade, more like 35, 40 years. Uh, I've been working with youth at risk, and I teach aviation. Uh, careers to young people. Uh, we start them off at a camp, and one of the things I want to ask John are you getting any any help from, we will say, parks and planning? Do you have a parks and planning down in Atlanta? You talk about playing on fields that, God Almighty, I don't even know how you were able to do it. Are you getting any funding or resources? That should be a given for a program mm -hmm. as great as yours. You ought to have folk that are already providing decent fields and the other point I want to make is when I started my program again about 40 years ago, I guess, it was about aviation. And, and, and I was blessed to be able to, to work with one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. I met him back in 1968. So you need also a spokesperson for what you're doing because <laughs> I'm like, Mr. Lucas, I don't know how you've been able to do what you've done all these years with the lack of resources. And, and, and I found out if you beat on enough doors and raise enough hell, especially when it comes down to, I've, I've been to Atlanta. I've been going to Atlanta for 25, 30 years off and on. I know what goes on down there. I got a lot of friends down there. But I can't imagine you having to put up with that, just the basic stuff without getting some resources from the local folk. Okay. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Jones, let me tell you where my dilemma falls. Uh, my dilemma falls in the mirror with me because I actually spend time on the field with the kids. I actually drive buses. I actually throw BP. I actually, I'm a part of it. So because of that, my, my, I say my competition, I have no competition because my goal is to help kids. So I'm not competing against other black programs, but there's a guy by the name of CJ Stewart. C.J. Stewart, instead of training kids how to play, uh, and I'm just being honest, and, and I, I hope not to be too critical, uh, but I'm just being honest. He realized that if I can put jackets on these guys and call them the ambassadors and put them and, 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 and dance them in front of white corporations, they'll give me money. Now, the program is called Lead, and it's about baseball, but I took a 13-year-old team to go over and play a 17-year-old team and we beat them eight to one. And he said, John, you know, we just use baseball as a chance to get them in the program, but we teaching them uh, 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 learning skills, academic skills, things of that nature. And I said, that's great. But with the kind of money that you're raising, CJ raises close to a million dollars. He got 18 kids. He lives in a half a million dollar house. His wife is on the program. His kids go to Howard now. This is the only job that he has. He has two kids in Howard. Um, and I don't know the man's personal business. I know he has a private practice 
where he used to give lessons to professional athletes, but many of them have have decided not to use them anymore. So I'm sure he gets others and it's reciprocal and he's making money doing that too. But uh, he's giving hitting lessons to Jason Hayward and uh, Dexter Fowler, and they both fired him. Uh, they're both from Atlanta. And uh, Dexter Fowler said uh, he, he don't want the man in 50 yards of him. Uh, and that's sad because he was his hitting instructor. I don't know what that's about. All I know is, like I said, my problem is me, Mr. Jones, because what I need to do now, I've raised my sons up. They're coaching. They're doing a good job. I got some other young people that have been in the program that I've raised up. They're coaching. They're doing it. Now I need to go after money in a facility where I can start taking kids at 10 years old in, develop them. Them. I have a couple of white guys that played for me that they're helping me with the uh, financial part. They both graduated Georgia Tech uh, uh, cum laude, uh, and they played in the program. Uh, they weren't kids in trouble, but I had a combined uh, diversity program. The reason why is because my kids went to private school. So I used to have the facility of the private school. And then once the pandemic hit, uh, they, they wouldn't let us use it anymore. And so I went oh. to start borrowing fields from different uh, organizations. But back to your issue, that is my number one goal this year is to raise money so we can build a facility to have training facilities academically and athletically for these kids. Because as I share with them, I threw 91 miles an hour when you never heard of me. I said, it's because of my education that I'm able to do this. But it's my love of the game is why I'm out here. And I love the game, so I use the game to teach you so that you may can get an education through it. And if you end up being good enough to play pro, then it's a blessing. But that's never been my goal, to make professional athletes out of these kids. My goal <laughs> is to get them well enough where they can get an education from it, and they'll always love the game well enough where we – what did we talk about at the beginning? Baseball is a game handed down from father to son or uncle to, to, to nephew or grandfather to grandson. And now, because of our limited fathers in the home, then you have to go to the parks and recreation. And you got people who don't know how to teach baseball. They don't know the game. Just because you got a bat, bat and a ball don't mean you can teach this game. It's a skill game enhanced by athleticism. With football, I don't have to know the game as well. If you're willing to tackle, run, and you got some speed and got hard, I can get you well enough where then you can, another coach can pick you up. But baseball, I got to teach you from the T to the skill of the game to where to throw the ball in the situation mentally, physically. It's a lot of stuff. And so if you're not raised up playing it, you can't pick it up at 16. Sounds like you were stretching yourself, John, for many yeah, years. I, I have for 20 years. Yeah. For 20 Gary, years. Gary, you want to come on in here? Gary? Well, I see uh, Coach Ty coming in here. Coach okay, Ty is in. Okay, okay so, let me, Ty, Ty Barnett, my man. Uh, Ty is a, is a um, physical fitness trainer um, over at uh, Inside Barnett's Boxing and Physical Fitness Gym. Ty went over to Baltimore with me last Monday night. Did Ty awesome. come in and, and tell us uh, how did the kids enjoy the outing, Ty? Or something like that. That was their first time. Yeah, yeah, it was their first time. How y'all doing? How everyone doing? All right. Fine. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm here with three of them now. Okay. All right. Oh. Three of them right now. Three of the ones. Yeah, my daughter, granddaughter, and the friend of hers. We all here right now. I was just, I'm, I'm late. I'm sorry I came in late, but I was sitting here eating and talking, running my mouth a little bit, you know, so. But, yeah, um, everybody enjoyed it. They're still talking about it to the day. How much fun they had so it was a good outing yeah it was good and everything the weather was nice real nice so yeah but um yeah i like everybody you like it yeah they said everybody said they liked it just give me a touch come here baby. give me a minute just say hi just say. hello hi hey i'm glad you guys enjoyed yourselves <laughs> that's the other one was said and this one more she's coming okay hey how you doing <laughs> You, and you remember them now, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I remember them. <laughs> that was yeah. a whole different type of environment for them to go in, Ty. So I'm glad you took time out, man, to drive over to Baltimore, man. And, and yeah. You know, they could experience something like that. They they already looking for um something else like that to do now. They was talking about it today when we was in church. They was asking about it. 
That's it. Um, anybody got any more tickets or anything? I said, no, nah, I'll, I'll see. I'll see. Keep them John, John is working on that for me, a time. We, we're working on that, so it'll be another trip over there. I just got to get a sofa. I got to get a sofa. Come on in. Uh, come on in, Gary. Well, I just think it's important growing up. Uh, look at the programs that I've been involved in that the young people, young kids, boys and girls be exposed to uh, these programs. Many of them don't have uh, the, the uh, resources, but man, these coaches and people like John, you don't know how many times something that you do or say has touched a kid and they can remember it and then they pass it on. It, it, it really is valuable. Um, the, you, you just can't put a price tag on how much that can do for a young person. And I looked at the picture, uh, Mr. Bell, that you sent, and hopefully you could see it when I pulled it up with the kids, the mm -hmm. bright faces at the ball game. And, and then Coach Ty talked about the, saw the young ladies there, how they really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lewis, well, believe it or not, believe it or not, Gary, um, you know, I had the opportunity to realize what an impact it was in a strange way. And I'll try to make this story quick. You know, I told you guys I, I coached at a private school uh, and they let me use their facility in the summertime for the inner city kids to be able to play on. And so I always had a feel by using that and I didn't. And because I never tried to make any money out of it, Rick, it didn't matter to me that I wasn't making any money. I had a feel, had a cage, had everything I needed. They kept the feel up. Well, anyway, uh, I think it was 9-11, around 9-11. Uh, financially, I went bankrupt. And uh, uh, when I say went bankrupt, I didn't file bankruptcy, but uh, my company, uh, I had a partnership with a company and we had to close the doors. And so I was headed to the school at the private school that I, my kids went to. And I ran across one of the kids that, that I coached who, who dad was a millionaire, but he wanted him to play with us because he didn't grow up a millionaire. He grew up in the city streets of New York. And he said, I want him to be able to play with you. I don't want to play in that country club up there. I want to play here with you. And so Are you still that young? So he played with me. And um, 10 years later, or maybe 20 years later, uh, well, well, fast forward, I'm sorry. Uh, I went to let them know I couldn't afford to pay for school anymore. And he told me, he says, I give a school $100,000 a year as, <laughs> as an endowment. He says, so I'm going to tell them to make your two kids the recipients of some of that money wow. so you, your kids can keep going. And I said, Steve, you know, my pride got in the way, guys. I said, Steve, you don't have to do that, man. He said, no, I do. He said, you don't know what you're doing out there coaching, man. And I'm thinking, like, I'm just coaching some middle school kids. Like, you know, what am I doing to myself? He says, what you're doing is invaluable. And 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 since I'm going to give – my company's going to give them the money anyway, I'm going to deem. I said, okay, well, give me two years, and I'll be back on my feet. He said, it takes – now, first, I said a year. He said, man, it take anybody at least two to three years to, to get things going again. I said, okay, too. <clears throat> he said, why well, don't you just keep giving it, getting it as long as I'm giving it? I said, well, I said, you know, he said, I know, John, you proud, man. You want to pay your own way. He said, well, you let me know when I need to take you off the list. So long story short, I was able to receive it for two and a half, almost two, I'd say three years because two full years and then the third year of portion and then God bless me. I was back on my feet making the money I could. It cost forty thousand dollars a year for my kids to go there for both of them. So it wasn't no cheap place, but I was able to make it happen. God bless me. I turned it around. But fifteen years later, I'm taking my wife to New York for a um, birthday present, and when, he says, "When are you gonna be there?" And so Steve's a white guy, Italian. He's from there, and I told him, he said, "Oh man, we're gonna be up there also." So he shows up. He got tickets to the show. Okay, I said, okay, you already bought the tickets? He said, yeah, man, I want you to have the best seat. I said, okay. He says, I want you to go to my favorite restaurant, pays for dinner. And I said, Steve, let me pay for something, man. Stop. And so he said, John, can we, can we? me and Susan want to talk to you. Tiki, come in. My wife's name is Tiki, guys. Tiki, come in. So we came in. I, I was in my hotel. I was at the Waldorf. And we came in and sat down. And his wife just started crying. And I'm like... I'm like, what's wrong? He said, we never told you this, but Michael was going to see a psychiatrist and was suicidal until you start coaching him. 
and start breathing life into him and start making him believe in himself. He said, and I knew if you could do that for my son, what you were doing for all those kids that didn't have my son's resources. He said, a lot of people don't realize that kids are there to be molded. And a lot of times they bring them down and they make themselves feel like they're big by putting them down. But the kids start feeling bad about themselves and thinking that they're nobody, that they're nothing. And they had coaches that would do that because if you think about when we grew up in the hard streets, where at least me, the coaches talk bad about you, but we'd be like, screw him. But we didn't care because we believed in us. But when you deal with fragile minds of today's era and you're not positively putting positive reinforcement into them, then and they trust you, they look up to you, and you tell them they'll never amount to anything, they're no good, they're sorry, they believe that in some cases. They're not hard street kids they're like, screw you, man. I heard that a thousand times. You know, so long story short, to answer your question, Mr. Jones, I found out that impact from a guy who I would have never thought the impact was in his son. He said, hey, you know, Michael's good now. He doesn't, he, he doesn't need counseling as much. I never knew. I knew he was a quiet kid. He didn't say much, but he was very athletic. And, uh, you know, he ended up being our center fielder and, uh, and ended up playing uh, two gardens to shoot the lights out of it. But before that, he said that he didn't want to live. The coaches had convinced him that he was nothing. And so we have to be very careful and how we talk to young people, because it's our job to motivate them, to inspire them. And, you know, uh, this young this young man, uh, uh, Coach uh, Barnett, I'm sure he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Motivating them. You know, yes, you're going to go through trials and tribulations. Yes, I'm going to coach you up. Yes, I'm going to critique you hard. But before I leave you, I'm going to let you know I believe in you. You're going to be okay. Just keep working hard. Keep the mm -hmm. grind going. And that's what we kind of tell them in baseball. Mm -hmm. Stay with the grind. I want to bring Luke, Luke back. And Luke, you came up in, in Northeast D.C. And I mean, you came off a playground with a guy named Kaya Battle. And oh, Kaya, yeah. I mean, Kaya, Kaya was a hell of a baseball coach, basketball coach, you name it, he could do it. And Lars and I went to Spangon High School together. We played football. He was an outstanding track and field athlete. What was that like growing up on that playground? You know, you looked and hearing what John say. How was Kaya? How did he inspire you guys, uh, uh, Luke? Well, Kaya Ballard uh, is probably cut from the same salt that uh, John, you, and and Harold, and and others uh, are cut from. He committed himself, as you have done to helping young people. Um, how, there's been so many times that I thought about how I got where I reached in sports. And I always thought about the experience that I had when I was much, much younger. And, and he touched us at, at the recreation level uh, before we even, uh, many of us before we even got into high school. And I, I was amazed that uh, he had touched so many lives, just as you have. Um, it's just too bad that um, with things being what they are today, I don't think we have a lot of uh, John Hollands out there. And I, mo I most certainly don't believe we have a lot of Kaya Ballads. Uh, this this man worked late at night. Uh, he came to work in the recreation center, and he was coaching sometime two and three different teams and young people. And uh, he would take us all through a season. But uh, when when we look back at um, some of the accomplishments that many young kids at Spingarn High School. Uh, had accomplished, uh, we look back and we found out so many of those people, all those young men like myself, came through the recreation center, came through people like Kaya Ballard and others, and uh, Coach Brown and uh, McNair and Hammond. So um, I don't think we have enough um, people like that around. 
And um, I, only thing I can say is just listening to you and, and uh, seeing what you've been through and what you've done for so many. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, blessed to hear you talk and, and hopefully that uh, a lot of young people are getting, there are more John Hollinses out there and Harold Bells out there that's still uh, pushing where other people are giving up. Thank you, Eric. thank you. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Lucas. I truly appreciate that, that means a lot. You know, I tell Harold all the time, Steve Jobs, was ta they talked to Steve Jobs uh, before he passed away and they said, if you had to tell anybody anything, what would you tell them? And he said, I would tell them that the most important currency is good health. He said, I got a month to live, maybe two. He said, and I would give everything I have for good health. He said, and I would tell them to try to love somebody every day. He said, because I spent more time loving me and not loving others. And now I don't have time to love them back. And he died two weeks later. He thought he had a month, but he only had two weeks. And I tell Harold that because, you know, um, I, I call him sometimes to uh, bounce off of him my frustrations of uh, these programs that get all this money and they're not doing anything for the kids. They just know how to go in front of the right people and do the right song and dance. And then they put it in the bank. You know, they got a mural outside the wall, this dude, and he ain't doing nothing. You know, I mean, and uh, and I tell Harold, I said, hey, man. And he just said, John, hang in there. And then he, he bounces off me everything that he's done and accomplished. And we all know, amazing. It's like, man, you know, I just need to get paid for some of this stuff. And I said, Harold, remember what Steve Jobs said. Don't I tell you, Harold, <laughs> hey, the most important currency is good health. So, hey, you loaded with that. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, that's a blessing. So um, I'm going to try to do a better job of fundraising. That's my goal this year. Uh, I've created, um, I've had a brother who's an architect from Howard help uh, design an architect, uh, a sketch for me on the facility that I'm trying to do. And, you know, that's another story because, you know, his wife, ex-wife don't want him playing with the black folks. So he played with the white folks and practiced with us and <laughs> wants us to give him lessons but then go play with the white folks. And I said, man, you, you got to make a decision, bro. I mean, you know, if, if you think that, 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 that they milk colder, then drink that milk. I mean, but it, it, it's not fair for me to take time out to work with your kid and then he's going to be on the other team facing us. I said, I'm trying to develop kids that, that need the help, that want the help, and that's going to help this group. I said, you know, he said, well, it's my ex-wife, man. She don't, she, she trying, she, the last thing she wanted to do is be around in the city. And then that being the case, you know, us being divorced and me getting remarried, it's another thing, man. But that's another story in itself. But my point is, I got to do a better job. You know, as I tell the kids, accountability is the one thing that is consistent among the kids that I've coached. And I have to hold my own self accountable. If I want to get more, then I have to work hard at getting more and I have to trust God's word. You know what they say, when you start planning, God laughs because he has other plans. And so I'm now listening to him and to follow those plans. And just the other day, a friend of mine gave me tickets to the uh, Atlanta Open. It's like the U.S. Open only in Atlanta. And I wasn't going. I got them for. Bert, who was on the show before, Bert's a 74-year-old uh, ex-scout coach that helps my kids. He's taking a full-time job to move back to California to coach a junior college, believe it or not. And he's excited like a 30-year-old kid because he loves the game. And so for he's, a, he's a, a big tennis player, too. So for a gift, I got him these sweet tickets from the Truist Bank. He's sitting right up front, all the food, all the drinks and everything. And he calls me and says, man, I've been packing boxes. He said, I'm so tired. I don't know if I can make it down there. Can you go with me? This is where God comes in. So I go with him. The guy who's hosting the suite 
just got the promotion and is trying to help nonprofits get more money to help kids with kids program. Mm -hmm. And God put me right there with him. Wow. I'd have never met this dude if he wouldn't have gone because I wasn't going. And so I went because I didn't want to waste the tickets. You know, a $500 piece tickets, I didn't want to waste them. Even though for a corporation, they don't care. But for me, if you give me something, I want to respect enough to show up. So I just wanted to at least show up. And, and now we have a meeting set up to move towards trying to figure out how we can finance this thing. Shaquille O'Neal came to my coach's wife's school to tell her he wants her to be the principal or the headmaster of his academy he wants to build. Well, I want an academy in this program. So now I'm setting up a meeting trying to get to him through her so we can say, hey, we might can do this. So God's plan is different from your plan. I thought it was about baseball and developing kids starting at a young age, but it's really about developing young men and young women uh, to be better citizens, to be able to utilize the resources that are here in America so that they can better their communities. And if baseball is a sport that they play, then fine, but no matter how good you are, you're not going to play forever. And so right. getting them in the right position, trying to partner with Apple and Microsoft to do coding, uh, to do software development, to learn those skill sets so that there are scholarship opportunities out there for kids of color. You know, with the 100 Black Men, we have seven scholarships for Drake University Law School. If you graduate with a 3-2 or better and make a 152 on the LSAT, that we can give you a full ride if you're in our program, but we've given to kids that look like us that wasn't in the program, but we want to make sure the seven didn't go away. So if you know a young brother, they want a young brother because it seems like every time we say we got somebody, it's a young sister. Not that they don't want young sisters. They're still offering, but they're like, can y'all find me some young black men? And, and we are the 100 black men of America, you know, 10,000 members strong. 100 chapters, and we can't find seven to mm -hmm. meet that criteria. Wow. To give them a free law education. I think there's a medical school in Tennessee called Meriwether? Meharry. 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 We got eight We got eight of those. And we sent eight girls for the last four years, and they said, no more girls. <laughs> we need boys. Do you mm -hmm. have any boys? And we can't find any to meet the criteria academically. Okay. We getting out of college by the skin of our teeth. Right. But you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to have a three, two. You got to have a three. And you got to study. You know, you got to do those. So where does that start? It starts with the youth. So that's why we have an academic program and our baseball program where we study, we study the um, SAT. We focus on the, the standardized testing because those are barriers that keep us out. White people will tell you that the SAT is not structured because the questions are sometimes fundamentally different from the questions that we get asked when we're in school through the systems that we work or live in. They're different. So, so we don't necessarily, how you ask the question, it's not necessarily the answer or the question, but how you ask the question. And if you ask it a certain way, it's not comprehensible in the time needed as it would be for somebody else who, who that's the way they speak to each other. So the ACT has been more favorable for young men of color. So we push them to take the ACT. And, uh, you know, down south, they push the SAT. But because I have this information, Princeton even has a review that you can do the Princeton review and study the SAT, and we were doing that, and they were giving you the test too, but now you can't get the test unless you pay them money, but you can practice. You know, it's just a lot of barriers out there that, you know, you only know what you know, and then once you start learning these things and you give it to these young people, our young people are amazingly smart. I mean, amazingly smart, so much more smarter than I was when I was that age, but they're smart in areas they have nothing to do with them getting past these barriers that they got. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, they're learning stuff that's not going to help them financially. They're not going to help them manage their money. They're not going to get them in school. But they can turn a PlayStation inside and out. 
they know all the cheat codes and know how to play all the different games and know how to get to the top. So I ask questions to these young people. Do you know that these are jobs that people get? And so we're trying to find out how to get them acclimated to get in front of some of these job opportunities and gaming because they're lucrative. They pay gaming developers a lot of money. You know, find out what their passion is and see if we can get them in. But that's enough for me, man. I know it's four o'clock. Uh, we were t talking about baseball, but we're really talking about young people. We want to uh, get out of here, but I want to get out of here by saying uh, the NBA, uh, the great Bill Russell uh, died. And um, I want to get a, take everybody take a minute and just tell me uh, how did you relate to Bill Russell and, uh, and his great career with the Boston Celtics. Let's start off with Rick Jones. Rick? Well, the Boston Celtics were yeah. my favorite team. Needless to say, I'm a, a little bit younger than you, Harold, 78. In the day, I lived to see the Boston Celtics. Interesting enough, um, a couple guys that are close friends of mine um, both went to Armstrong. In fact, uh, Harold J. Preston has been on your program. Mm -hmm. And also Courtney. I don't know if you know Jim Courtney. Yeah, I know. Jim Courtney was <clears throat> good friends with Sam Jones. And make a long story short, I got to meet Sam Jones years ago, and he told me some of the stories that that's probably that, uh, or the, the experiences that the Celtics had that's black folk <laughs> up in Boston. And one of the stories that pained me more than anything uh, was a story of uh, some white folk coming into Bill Russell's house. I don't know whether you heard that or not, Harold. Yes, I heard it. And <laughs> defecating, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But I say all of this to say Bill Russell was and will be one of my heroes, uh, the way he stood up to racism, even until his dying day. Yep. Okay, John, give us a... I, 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 I um, reciprocate the fact that Bill Russell will always be one of my heroes. My father spoke of him highly. I didn't see him play, but my father talked about it. When they used to talk about who the greatest, he said, man, he got more rings than anybody else. He the greatest. And he coached why he got some of them rings. He coached and played, got out of the ring, and the greatest player that ever played, Will Chamberlain, he shut him down for the championship. He said, now, when I say shut him down, I think Will might have scored 30. But that's shutting Wilt down. Because Wilt averaged 50 and 30 one year. 50 points and 30 rebounds. Can you believe that? And they still trying to say it's LeBron James or is uh, uh, Michael Jordan the greatest. 50 points and 30 rebounds. Can't nobody ever say they did that. But Wilt Chamberlain, but he said Bill Russell's the greatest because he knew how to win the championship. He got the rings. He could play defense. He said, let me defend him. I'll keep him out of there. And Bill Russell just always stood up for right. He never backed down. And uh, just seemed like a stand-up guy. I didn't know him personally, but what I saw him, read of him, he was always a hero of mine. Well, you know, John, I'm so glad you said that. Uh, Wilt was the greatest. There's no doubt in my mind. Wilt was the greatest. But but Bill was the greatest winner of all. He had, he had uh, people around him that also knew how to play the game. If I told Gary earlier, if you had told Wilt to go out and just block shots, Nobody could have touched. He could run. He could jump. He could do everything. But Russell had a role to play, and he played that role to a T. And you know, my my favorite people are the Boston Celtics because of my relationship with uh, Red Auerbach and with Sam Jones and with Casey Jones. All those guys went before Russell. So there's a welcoming party up there in basketball heaven. Uh, for Bill Russell, you know, he, great, great athlete, man. Uh, went to the University of San Francisco where he did everything, him and Casey Jones. That's a, you know, he's going to be solely missed. I mean, they, in the NBA, they will always remember uh, Bill Russell. Gary, what do you have to say? Well, um, <laughs> this is, as, as everyone was talking, I was thinking, man, this is what they mean when they say barroom arguments. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody has merit. I remember, I'm young enough or old enough to remember seeing Russell play at the end of his career. Um, at the time, I didn't know how great he was, but as I got older. You don't froze up. Garrett froze up. 
Darren and froze up. Man. <laughs> the producer just froze up. It froze up. <laughs> the producer just, just froze up. Hey, look, I just want to say, man. Uh, that means it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, it's time to go. To tie the tie bond there to uh, my friend Rick Jones. Thank you for taking time out to be here on uh, Speak the Truth. Looking forward to to having you back here, Rick. And I haven't you. gone anywhere, Harold. It's my health that has slowed me down. And John, I say to you, uh, I would love to get your email. Uh, trust me, I listen to you. And uh, as I said, I've been dealing with kids for over 40 years, basically. And some of the concerns you have, trust me, I've, I've had, and Harold, probably even more so. So mm -hmm. we're right there with you, but I love to have your email, man. And you never know, again, I'll email you. how we can communicate. And one of the things that I love about what Harold does is bring people together, especially people of like minds. And I told Harold, I had, of course, known about Harold years ago, but we had a disconnect because we were on different paths, but we met again maybe 10 or 12 years ago. One of the things I told him is anybody that's interested in kids, I'm interested in, and anything I can do for my lowly statue, okay, I will do. So I'd love to have your email and we can communicate. Hey, hold on, hold on. What's, what's your phone number? 301. John, I'll give it to him. He got no, it. no, I got it right now. I'm, I'm going to put it in, 301. 775-4386. Okay. I'll text you my, is that your cell? Yes. Okay, I'll text you my email. That's a deal. Okay, guys, that's going to be it uh, for this. Thank you, Harold. All right, you're welcome. And just remember, like I said, they they like our rhythm, but they don't like our blues. And remember, you cannot soar with eagles if you're going to hang out with chickens. Until next time, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone. So long. Bye-bye. How do I? Say goodbye to what we had. The good times that made us laugh out away in the bad. Had. And I thought we'd get to see forever. But forever's gone away It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday And I don't know where this road is gone To be my sunshine after the 